Well, good morning. It's uh, very nice to be here. Great to see all of you. I am honored uh, to come for a second time to New Covenant Church, and it's great to be with you and to worship with you this morning. I will tell you, I had a check in my spirit when Pastor Chris came up, and he started by saying, we don't believe in purgatory here. And then I was afraid he was going to introduce me at that point and say I was a guest speaker for the day. And <laughs> I need to do more study on the doctrine of purgatory. But it's, it's wonderful to be here. And I trust that uh, the spirit of the living God will uh, speak to you this morning through his word. Not long ago, I was uh, reading in the book of Job, and I came across a statement that that man of suffering, that man of wisdom made. It's in chapter 5 and verse 7. And this is what he said. He said, mankind is born for trouble, even as sparks fly upward. I had to stop and think about that. I can remember times in my youth. I can remember times with family and camping. And uh, there were those occasions when there was a fire that was burning. You experienced this perhaps yourself as a family out in your backyard. Wonderful summer evening and the fire that had been started is starting to get lower, starting to burn out. And someone will go over and pick up a log and throw that log on the fire. Immediately, if there are any children there, they'll start to ooh and ah because there are sparks that are flying upward. That's what will happen when you throw a log on a fire. Or if you have ever watched a blacksmith. I grew up on a farm in western Pennsylvania, and from time to time I would see blacksmiths at uh, county fairs and uh, state farm shows. And here's what would happen. They would take that piece of metal that would become a shoe for a horse, and they would put it into a hot fire until it was glowing take it out and put it on an anvil and start to hammer that piece of metal. Sparks will go out to the left and the right, but sparks will also fly upward. So Job was right about that second part of his statement whenever he said, mankind is born for something as sure as sparks fly upward. He was saying that we are all destined for trouble in our life in one form or another. But here's the thing, we can say, yeah, that's true, that's true about life, but the problem that we have is that we don't like trouble. <laughs> we don't like trials, we don't like difficulties in our lives. In fact, we'll do just about anything to get rid of them. That's one of the reasons why you have auto insurance. <laughs> you wanna try to protect yourself from another driver, and if an accident does come, you'll you'll have some money from the insurance company that will help to pay for the repairs. That's why we buy health insurance. That's why a community like Naperville will spend thousands, maybe even millions of dollars every year to make sure that there is a police force to protect you, to keep you from trouble in a variety of different ways. Trouble is certain and we don't like it. We try to do just about everything that we can to get rid of it. So that leads us to the question, that is, if God is concerned about our lives, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment, what does God think about your troubles? What does he think about my troubles? In order to answer that question, we need to get our bearings in this book, and there are a lot of things that surround this book that we refer to as a context. There's a larger context, and, and, and we need to consider that. For example... I want you to make note of the fact that um, in this context, there is an author. <laughs> Every piece of literature has an author. This text certainly has one, and the author is identified. You'll notice in chapter 1, it says James. James, a servant of God. Now, a lot of commentaries have speculated, who is this James? How should we understand him? Most conservative uh, conservative scholars would say that this is James, the half-brother of our Lord. And so it's this James who is the author of the book. He saw things from our Lord uh, firsthand, and he was also uh, one of the ones, you'll remember, who came probably with his mother out of concern for Jesus. 
they thought that he was mad. They thought something had happened to him. And so the brothers and Mary, they come to him hoping that they can take him away and they can work with him perhaps to deal with some sort of mental imbalance. But all of that has changed. Because if this is Jesus, the half-brother of our Lord, I want you to make note of the fact that he calls himself a servant in verse 1 of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. What in the world does he mean by that, a servant? It's interesting, the word that he uses is the word doulos. Uh, some translations, which I would say is probably the correct translation, refer to him as a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our more modern translations will say, let's not use that word slave. Uh, we're not comfortable with that in a culture that has had to deal with slavery over the years so we refer to him as a servant but what James is really saying is I am one who is sold out to Jesus I see myself as an owned individual and the one who owns me is Jesus this is the author of this text James a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ notice not only does this passage and this book have an author it also has an audience and the audience is important for example, would you make note of the fact that in the second part of verse 1, it says, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Now, we speculate again about what does he mean by the 12 tribes? Is he referring to the Old Testament tribes? Uh, we're not sure exactly, but one thing we can say, he is probably referring to Jewish people who are now identified with the Lord Jesus. Maybe it's this new tribal group uh, primarily Jews who have come to acknowledge that Jesus is their Messiah. So uh, he's saying, I'm writing to Jewish people and I'm writing to people in the dispersion. Many of them have been uh, spread out, forced out of Jerusalem, and they're traveling to who knows where. And he's speaking to these individuals who are facing a lot of trouble in their lives. In fact, if you could talk to some of these people in the dispersion, you could probably discover their worldview. If you were to say to them, uh, what about trouble in your life? What do you think about that? Here's what they would say. Trouble is terrible. Avoid it at all costs, but we're experiencing a lot of trouble. Ask them about what would you do in the midst of the trouble, and they would say, well, I, I think what we really need is we need some wisdom in our lives, but wisdom is waning. That'd be a second part of their worldview. How do you think you could get out of the trouble in your life? And one of the things that they would probably say, well, uh, wealth would be wonderful. If we could just have some more wealth, that would help us to deal with the trouble in our lives. So James is dealing with an audience who would say, trials are bad, trouble's terrible, wisdom is waning, wealth would be wonderful, but we don't have it. What in the world are we going to do? I want you to also notice that in addition to having an author and an audience, James has an aim. We have to dig a little bit to see what that aim is, but he's, he's trying to say, I, I want you to understand something. I want you to look at life a little bit differently. Maybe even a second look at the topic we're talking about. For example, would you notice in verse 2, you get about midway through the verse, and it says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials. I find it interesting. He said, when you meet trials, he's almost personifying these trials as though it's an individual, and we know that trials are not something out here. Trials are around us and in us, and so sometimes we do meet up with people who are in the midst of trials. So in verse 2, he talks about trials. Then go on to verse 3, and you'll notice he says, for you know that the testing of your faith so he's coming at trials from, from another perspective. And when he talks about testing, he's talking about trying situations. So it's almost uh, he's doubling up on this word trial. So you'll meet trials of various kind. And when you are tried in these experiences, you, you need to take a look at something and understand it differently. And then drop all the way down to verse 12. And notice there he comes back and he uses this word again. He says, blessed is the man. <laughs> that can't be possible. Is it? Blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman. Blessed is the teenager. Blessed is the young adult. Blessed is the person who remains steadfast under trial. James is the author who's trying to tell us something in the midst of this idea that we think that trials are horrible and we're trying to get away from that. What is he telling us? 
I often say to people, if you remember anything about what I'm saying, I hope you remember this. And here's what I think God wants me to remember and what he wants you to remember as well. And that is that uh, God is using your trials to transform you. In fact, your trials are God's tools to bring about spiritual transformation in your life. Your difficulties in life, James is saying, are God's devices in the spiritual world in which we live to bring about positive spiritual development. And some of you were saying, Harry, I'm not convinced. (laughs) I'm not convinced that I want any more trials. I don't want to experience another season in my life of trials. Why is that the case? I want to try to answer two questions about that point that I just presented to you. Your trials are God's tools to bring about spiritual transformation. So the two questions are this. First question is, why would a God who we say loves us allow us to experience pain, financial hardship, difficulty? Why why would a good God allow that sort of thing? That's the first question. Second question is, okay, if he does and we're convinced of that, then what should we do in the process? Okay, there's the two questions before us. So uh, let's go back to this first one. Why would a God who we say is a good God, and you believe that, it's part of your doctrinal statement. I'm sure it's part of a lot of sermons that you've heard over the years. If God is a good God, a loving God, a kind God, why would he allow us to go through trials? I'll simply respond and, and say that the problem with that is that we have a worship problem. Do you know what the worship problem is? Worship problem is not what kind of music are we going to sing, what kind of music we're going to allow into our homes or into our automobiles when we're driving to work and we want to hear a song that relates to God. We're not talking about that when we say we have a worship problem. The worship problem is that even though we don't like to admit it, the worship problem is us. We end up worshiping ourselves. You see, even when I say to you, I I don't think I should experience any more trouble in my life, I'm really saying I I deserve better. God, you ought to do better things for me. Let me call three texts of Scripture to mind. For for example, um, I would call your attention to Luke chapter 11. Uh, Here's the the situation that's going on. Uh, The disciples come to Jesus, and and they say to him one day, "Uh, Lord, Teach us to pray, even as John taught his disciples to pray. I paraphrase. Jesus said to them, you want to know how to pray? I'll teach you how to pray. I'll tell you something about prayer. Uh, Here's what you need to know. And, And Jesus says this. When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Think about that for a moment. Father, hallowed be your name, not my name, even though I, I like positive affirmation. My Hallowed be your name. Your name be above and beyond everything else. Your kingdom come. Not my agenda? No. Not my kingdom? No. Your kingdom. So Jesus knew early on that the purpose of, of our living was to make sure that we were exalting God and making sure that his kingdom would move forward. In other words, he is the primary purpose of worship. Our focus is upon him. Or consider another passage of scripture. You know this one. You probably even have it memorized. It's uh, Romans chapter 8. You know where I'm going right away, don't you? Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. Make sure you keep those two verses together. Several years ago, um, a good friend of our family uh, sent me a text message and said, Hey, Harry, uh, could I talk to you sometime today? And she went on in, in the text to tell me they were having difficulties with their son. And um, it, it was a sad situation. Things were happening. And she said, I don't know what to do. She said, I'm so frustrated. She said, I'm even angry at God. And Harry, when we talk, you make sure you, you don't quote from Romans chapter 8, 28. <laughs> okay, I, I won't do that. But here's what Romans 8, 28 and 29 says. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. 
For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he, talking about Jesus, he might be the firstborn among many brothers. He would be the one who would have first place. He would be the primary one, the preeminent one. So here we come back again. Whenever we begin to think about trials, we don't like them because a lot of times we have this worship problem. When we want to be worshipped, we want to be comfortable, we want to be cared for. And God comes back and, and says, but Jesus is to be the preeminent one. Consider one other passage of Scripture. The other passage of Scripture is in John 11. Jesus and the disciples one day are going about, they're preparing to preach, and they come across a man who is born blind. And the disciples, now before you criticize them, if you had lived in that culture in that day, you would probably ask the same question. Lord, who sinned? This man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither, neither. But this has happened so that the works of God might be manifested in him. I don't understand everything about the sovereignty of God or the providence of God, but can you imagine? Here's this man from birth, all the way up to this point in time. I'm not sure exactly how old he was. And, and he comes to this point in, in which Jesus performs a miracle and gives him his sight so that the works of God could be manifested in him. And others would see that Jesus is the preeminent one. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say in an answer to this question, what in the world would a God who loves us, why would he allow his people to go through suffering? It's because God, in the midst of suffering, wants to get our attention so that we might begin to say, God, you are supreme over everything. I owe all my allegiance to you and to no one else. And because of that, your trials and my trials are God's tools to bring about positive spiritual transformation. The difficulties you're facing in life are God's devices to turn around and to bring about positive spiritual development. Why does God do that? Because he wants to get, us our, get our attention and show us that he is supreme over everything. Now that brings to, uh, to our attention that second question that I wanted to try to answer. And the second question, okay, if this is true, if you are to accept that, and I pray and hope that you will, I pray it for my life as well, that God is doing this, then how should we respond to the trials that come our way? This text is, is, is going to show us. Now, uh, I like to think of it of an illustration when I think of what's going on here, an illustration I've used before, and I don't think I've used it here at New Covenant. If I have, just smile and say, well, that's nice. But, but here's what I think about sometimes. We, we are constantly going around and we are positioning ourselves without a lot of detail this morning, I'm going to assume that many of you walked into the bathroom, maybe opened the shower door, reached in and turned the nozzle and the water started to come out. There's a possibility that uh, one of the things that you might have done is you reached in and said, oh boy, yeah, that, the temperature's right, about a one, 103, that's pretty good, that's the temperature I like. And, and you might say, you know, I think right now water's coming out, it's probably about, uh, half, three quarters of a gallon of water per minute, uh, that, that, that's pretty good speed, good, a pretty good rate of, of the water coming out. And then you close the door and walk away. That would be foolish, you wouldn't do that. Here's what you would do. You would step into the shower, let the water come out, you would position yourself to get that shower this morning. Or if after the service this morning, we're walking in the parking lot and uh, we walk up to a car and it's, boy, this is a beautiful car. And you say, yeah, this is, or family car. Oh, uh, how long have you had the car? You give me a lot of details and different things, and uh, you start to walk away, and I said, wait a minute, where are you going? And you said, oh, I, this is where I leave my car. I brought it over here. Uh, elder said I could park my car here during the day, and I, I'm just leaving it right here. That, that's all you're going to, that's all I'm going to do. What a waste, because you never position yourself behind the steering wheel to move ahead. So in other words, to take advantage of that vehicle, to take advantage of that shower, we have to position ourselves. And the same thing is true with what James is saying in this passage of Scripture. We have to position ourselves under the Word of God to obey the Word of God so that we might benefit from the trials that we're facing. So here's what we need to do. 
The first of three things that I want you to see in this text is that we need to make sure that we are going to position ourselves to reflect on our trials. I say this because of verse 2. James says, count it all joy, my brothers. Now, you might have a translation that says something like this. Consider it all joy, my brothers. I like that word, consider. It's the idea of standing back and, and making sure that you are observing something, you are looking at something, and saying, what is the value of all of this? If you were to go to the Art Institute this afternoon, I would hope one of the things you would not do is get your ticket, walk in, and say, let's see if we can get out of here as fast as we possibly can. Now, you, you take time. You look at every painting. You look at every sculpture. And you try to imagine, what is it that the artist is trying to communicate? You consider it. And James is saying, do the same thing with your trials. He said, count it all joy. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. That phrase, various kinds, uh, can also be translated multifaceted, multicolored trials. If you go to your local Sherman Williams dealership and uh, one of the clerks says, well, what would you like today? What, what color? And you say, uh, I think blue. Uh, we, we've kind of decided we wouldn't want a blue. She says, well, I'll show you what we have. And he goes over and he pulls out 57 different varieties of blue. They are multifaceted. And here's the thing. Your trials are like that. See, the trials that you are facing, whatever they might be, the difficulties you encounter in life are different from the person across the street. And that person's trials are different from the single mother who's living at the end of the street, trying to figure out what life is all about, how to deal with her teenage sons. Everybody's trial is different, and God allows it in our life fitted just for us. Consider it all joy, he says, when you experience these trials of various kinds. Then look at um, verse 3. He does a progressive thing here. He says, for you know that the testing, the trying of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, that's why he can say, consider it joy or count it all joy, because this is what God is doing in the midst of your, of your trials. It produces steadfastness. And then in verse 4, he says, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So he's saying, whether you realize it or not, God is using your difficulties. God is using your trials, all different kinds. And he's using them to make sure that you are going to become perfect, not morally perfect, but in terms of your spiritual maturity, you are going to become perfect and complete. And God will give you everything that you need to navigate his kingdom. So the first thing we have to do, we have to position ourselves in such a way that we can reflect on the trials that we are facing. I have a friend, he and I meet from time to time, and uh, he is a wonderful pastor. Uh, he, he cares for people, he loves on people, and he and I have been friends for a number of years. And uh, my friend, his name is Amato. Amato is a collector, but not of coins, not of stamps. He collects wood from construction sites. And here's what happens. A model will be driving to his church one day, and he'll see a construction site. There'll be some wood out there, just scraps of wood, and he'll try to find someone and say, hey, can I take some of this wood? Sure, take whatever you want. A motto will take and select a piece of furniture and say, yeah, I can, or a piece of wood, and I, I can use that. Throw it in his van, but pick up another bit. No, I can't use that. Pick up another one. He'll use that. And he has some wonderful pieces of furniture in his home. He built a camper so that he and his family could go on camping trips. And he built the inside of that camper from these scraps of wood that many other people would have simply thrown away. We need to be careful about our trials. We need to think of them properly because your trials are tools in the hands of God to bring about spiritual transformation. So we need to position ourselves so that we can reflect on these trials and what God is doing in the process. Second thing we need to do, we also need to position ourselves so that we can request. That is, we can begin to ask the Heavenly Father who is good in all of his ways and say, God, um, I need some help in this situation. Notice how James puts this together, verse 5. He said, if any of you lacks 
wisdom. Remember I said one of the worldviews of these first century believers was that uh, wisdom was waning. We have this trouble. We're not sure what to do. We don't have enough experience. James says, here's what you do in that situation. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And it's the idea of continually ask God. Don't just give up now. The answer may not come right away, but you keep asking God. Keep asking him over and over again. And then he says something about God. Do you see this? He says in the middle of verse 5, ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. And we have a dilemma right at this point. Either we are going to believe that or we're not going to believe it. He says, who gives to all generously. And God opens the coffers of heaven, so to speak, and says, I, I know what you need. I'm going to give what you need right now, and I'll give it to you. Then it says, without reproach. God does not say, I didn't like the way you phrased that. Can you be a little more eloquent in your praying? No, he says he gives to all generously without being critical, without reproach. And he says it will be given to him. Ah, but notice there's a caution beginning in verse 6. But, but let him ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded person. He's a doubter. To be a doubter is to have two minds. God, I have this uh, problem right now. I'm asking you to help me. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And then we say, oh, boy, I need to take things into my own control. I, I don't think God's going to do anything. I prayed this same prayer yesterday. I didn't do anything then. James says, no. You need to ask of God. Ask of God again and again. Who gives generously. But don't doubt because if you doubt... You're basically saying, God, I don't believe you. I don't believe that you're generous. I don't believe that you're good. I don't believe that you're kind. I don't believe that you're merciful. You pray. One of the things about being a grandfather is you have an opportunity to watch your children and grandchildren in the way they do things. My children have uh, done things differently from the way uh, I treated them and disciplined them, but but I've been pleased to see certain things. They, they've been trying to keep, teach the children manners. Say please, say thank you, do, do all of those things. And then here's what, here's what has happened. I've noticed that there have been times and whenever the children will run in from outside and they'll go up to my daughter-in-law and say, Mommy, Mommy, uh, can I have some milk? Sure, you can have some milk. And she pours the milk. Hey, and Mommy, can, can I have a granola bar? Yeah, you can have a granola bar. I think the timing is right. Do that. And maybe a little bit later, they'll come in and say, Mommy, Mommy, can I have another piece of cake? No, you cannot have another piece of cake. Why not? Well, uh, you can't have another piece of cake because you had a piece and a half. You ate your sister's cake as well at lunch today. You're not going to get another piece of cake. That's not going to happen. Now, here's the amazing thing. Sometimes they'll say yes. Sometimes they'll say no. And the kids keep coming back. Because they know that their parents are good. And sometimes it may feel like God is saying no to you. God, I, I have this situation with my finances. I have this situation, this problem at the company. I, I feel that my relationship with my children are, are not the way they should be. And, and God, you keep coming back. Because God is good. He is a good heavenly parent. Did I tell you that you're trials are God's tools to bring about spiritual transformation. It's true. He's a good God, and he wants us to experience him in these trials to see how great he really is. And what do we do? We make sure that we take time to reflect on the trials in our lives. What, what, what is God trying to accomplish? And, and then we need to make sure that we request. There's a third position that we need to take, and we see this in verses 9 through 11. I'm saying that we need to position ourselves so that we will be ready to replace. Replace what, Harry? That we will be ready to replace our value system with God's value system. And here's why I'm saying this. Notice verse 9, another strange statement in this first chapter. 
Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. He says of the person who is marginalized, calls him the lowly brother. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. What in the world is that? James is trying to get them to see that because of their relationship with Jesus Christ, they have been exalted to a high and holy position in the eyes of God. Everyone else in the world might think that they're nobodies. But God says, because you belong to Jesus, you have this exalted position before God because you're related to him, you're identified with him. And then this rich person. The debate is, is the rich person a believer or, or an unbeliever? Uh, all I'll say at this point that the rich person, as described by Jane, is a person who has his focus on material resources. He thinks this is his security in life. James says not so. That rich person needs to realize that what's going to happen in his pursuit of all of these riches, he's like a flower of the field. That flower will come up in the spring and start to grow, and then... As it gets closer and closer to the summer, the sun will begin to beat down on that flower and it will wither and the petals will begin to blow away. Rich man is like that, he says. Now, a caution here. Is he saying that having riches is bad? Not at all. Riches is a blessing from God. It's a, it's a good thing. But if that becomes our idol, if that becomes our focus, if that becomes our means of getting away from our trials, we're in trouble. And James says that individual will pass away in his pursuits. So he says what we need to do, we need to replace the value system we have right now with what God's value system is. And we need to know what that value system is all about. In 2009, uh, I had the privilege of traveling to Chile and a missionary from the church I was serving at that time uh, wanted me to go with him. I was going to be teaching some pastoral classes and so we went, and, and before we left, he said, Harry, here's what I would suggest that you do. I would suggest that you get about $200, uh, keep that with you as cash, and then when we get to the airport in Chile, uh, what we'll do, we'll go to an exchange station, and you can exchange that for the currency of the country at that time. So, so that's what I did. I realized the longer the week went on, I would have not been able to function in that country if I did not have the currency of the land in which I was living for a week. We have to go through kind of an exchange process. We have to say, God, uh, I, I need to understand more and more what you treasure, what you value. Because God is working to use these difficulties that we have in life to transform us to be more and more and more like Jesus Christ. One more thought. When my oldest son, Phil, who was about five years of age, about that age, he, we purchased for him a bike, and it was a bike that had training wheels with it. And he would go with some of his friends in the neighborhood, and uh, he would ride different places. And I noticed that as the summer went on, uh, these neighborhood children were taking the training wheels off, and they were riding, and Phil was still riding with his training wheels. And so one day, when he was his mother, with his mother doing some different things, I decided I'm going to take the training wheels off, and that's what I did. And when he came home, he looked at that, and he said, Dad, I can't ride it like that. No, we're going to try to ride it. And so we would do some things, put him on the bike, and we'd kind of send him down the sidewalk, and uh, my wife was standing at the other end. She, she would catch him, but, but along the way, he would go into the grass, he would fall over, he kept saying, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. He got some bruises that summer learning how to ride that bike. One of the things that was the turning point is that my mother visited us in Colorado and um, she realized what she was doing and what, what we were doing with Phil and trying to get him to ride the bike. And, and so she said, Phil, I'll tell you what. She said, I'm going to be here for a few more days. If you can learn to ride that bike on your own, I'll give you $10. And sure enough, the ante was raised. <laughs> and he went out every morning and he'd ride that bike. He'd stumble some, he'd, he'd fall off the bike, he'd get some more scrapes and different things. By the end of the week, while my mother was there, he learned to ride that bike without training wheels. Why am I telling you that? 
because your life and my life is like that. We're, we're riding along and, and, and we think we can't do this and we fall and we tumble and life gets difficult. But we must understand that these trials are valuable to us. Your trials are God's tools. And he's using those tools to work in and through you to make you more and more like Jesus Christ. It seems to me that there are a couple of responses to a text like this. One text is, or one response is that we need to change our minds. The Bible calls that repentance. <laughs> it means that we need to change our minds and say, wait a minute, I, I've hated these trials. I complained to God about these trials. I complained to other people about my... I need to change my mind about that and to see that whatever it is, God is using it. That's the first thing we need to do. The second thing we need to do is to say, Lord, give me wisdom. Give me knowledge and then the skill to know how to apply this knowledge to my life. So that in everything I do, I'll be more and more like Jesus. And I'll glorify you in everything. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, I'll be the first to say I've hated some of the trials I've had to experience. And I've even told you that it wasn't fair, it wasn't right. I confess my sins and I'm assuming that my brothers and sisters will do the same. We confess that we've been wrong. And now, oh God, give us wisdom, give us insight to know how to live in this fallen world as people who belong to King Jesus. We pray this for the glory and honor of Jesus. Amen.